Chapter 17. Freedom's Boundaries at Home and Abroad, 1890-1900. Part 1. The 1890s witnessed multiple conflicts over American freedom. Many workers and their allies came to believe that employers were denying them economic independence and democratic self-government. Millions of farmers joined the populist movement to try to reverse their economic decline and take back the government from what they viewed as powerful corporate interests. A new racial system in the South confined African Americans to second-class citizenship status, denying them freedoms assumed by many Americans. Increasing immigration sparked debates about whether the nation should continue to offer freedom to foreigners. By the end of the decade, the nation, through the Spanish-American War, began to rule overseas possessions in Puerto Rico and for the Philippines. Many debated whether these new peoples would be subjects or citizens, and whether the United States was still a republic or had become an empire. Like workers, farmers in the South and West faced growing economic insecurity as agricultural prices fell and economic dependency on merchants and banks increased. Sharecropping kept millions of black and white southern farmers in poverty, and an oversupply of world cotton led to dramatic price decreases that threatened southern farmers' livelihoods and property. These farmers soon blamed their woes on railroads, high freight rates, high interest rate loans from bankers and merchants, and the fiscal policies of the federal government that reduced the money supply and farm prices. In response, Farmers organized the Farmers Alliance in Texas in the late 1870s, which quickly spread to dozens of states. The alliance at first stayed away from politics and established cooperatives called exchanges to finance and market crops. But when banks refused to loan money for the exchanges, the alliance proposed the sub-treasury plan. The federal government would establish warehouses where farmers could store their crops until sold, and by using their crops as collateral, the government would issue loans directly to farmers at low interest rates, ending their dependence on bankers and merchants for credit. Demands for the sub-treasury led the alliance to politics. In the early 1890s, the alliance formed the People's Party, called Populists, the era's greatest political insurgency. The populace appealed not just to farmers, but to all producers, including miners, industrial workers, and small businessmen. But most of its supporters were cotton and wheat farmers in the South and West. The populists organized massive educational campaigns using pamphlets, newspapers, and revival-style mass meetings throughout the country. This was the last expression of the 19th century idea that America was a commonwealth of small producers whose freedom rested on individual ownership of productive property and the dignity of labor. But the populists were forward-looking, embracing scientific methods of agriculture and modern technologies that made large-scale cooperatives possible, such as the railroad, telegraph, and national market, and they wanted the federal government to regulate them for the public interest, a very 20th century idea. The populace adopted a famous platform at their 1892 Omaha Convention. It proposed many measures to restore democracy and economic opportunity for ordinary Americans, some of which came to pass in the next century, such as direct election of U.S. Senators, government control of currency, a graduated income tax, low-cost public financing for farmers, and workers' rights to organize unions. The platform also called for national ownership of railroads to allow farmers to inexpensively get their crops to market. In some parts of the South, the populists heroically tried to unite black and white farmers on a common political and economic program, but the barriers were too great. Racism, the legacy of the Civil War, and the fact that many white populists were landowning farmers while black farmers were tenants and agricultural laborers facing a different set of problems, all came together against such an alliance. Black farmers organized their own Cotton Farmers Alliance, whose strikes were suppressed by white authorities, some of whom were even sympathetic to white populists. While white populists were hardly anti-racist, some recognized that whites would have to appeal to blacks in order to break the Democratic Party's hold on the South and its opposition to reform, and in a few places, like North Carolina, white and black populists together won state elections. In most of the South, however, Democrats defeated the populace by mobilizing whites to vote against Negro supremacy, intimidating blacks, and rigging elections. The populace also engaged the reform efforts of farmer and middle-class women and endorsed women's suffrage in many states. In 1892, the populist candidate for president, James Weaver, won more than one million votes, and the party carried five western states and elected three governors and 15 members of Congress.
when a severe depression in 1893 intensified conflict between labor and capital, it seemed that the populace might again gain the votes of industrial workers who had traditionally supported the two major parties. Employers used state or federal authority to protect their economic power and suppress labor unrest. In May 1894, the federal government dispersed Coxey's army, a march of the unemployed led by Ohio businessman James Coxey, that converged on the nation's capital. Also in 1894, workers in Pullman, Illinois, who manufactured railroad cars for the Pullman Company, went on strike against pay cuts. When the 150,000 members of the American Railway Union, a union of skilled and unskilled workers led by the charismatic Eugene V. Debs, refused to work on Pullman cars and thus paralyzed the nation's rail traffic, President Grover Cleveland won an injunction from federal courts that ordered the strikers back to work. Violence between strikers and troops from Maine to California left 34 dead, and when union leaders, including Debs, were in prison for violating the injunction, the strike collapsed. The Supreme Court reaffirmed Debs' sentence in a famous ruling approving the use of injunctions against strikes. Debs claimed that powerful capitalists aligned with state and national government now infringed on Americans' freedoms. In 1894, the populace doubled their efforts to appeal to industrial workers, and in state and congressional elections that year, with the Depression worsening, voters abandoned the Democrats. The populist vote in rural areas increased, but most workers did not vote populist. Few populist demands spoke to workers' needs, as their calls for higher agricultural prices would raise food costs for workers and diminish the value of their wages, and the movement's Protestant and revivalist culture alienated Catholic and immigrant workers. Urban workers instead voted for the Republicans, who argued that higher tariff rates would revive the economy by protecting American manufacturing and workers from imports and cheap foreign labor. The Republicans gained a massive 177 seats in the House. In 1896, the Democrats and populists united behind presidential candidate William Jennings Bryan, a young congressman from Nebraska. Bryan had won the Democratic nomination in a speech that captured the fears and hopes of farmers. Bryan called for the free coinage of silver, the unrestricted minting of silver money, and he used biblical imagery to condemn the gold standard in perhaps the most famous lines of political oratory in American history. You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Bryan's demand for free silver was the latest expression of a long-standing view that increasing the amount of currency in circulation would raise the prices of farmers' crops and make it easier for them to pay their debts. Bryan's nomination represented a shift in Democratic leadership away from elites like Cleveland, who had long been tied to Eastern businessmen. But Bryan's appeal was highly religious and revivalist, and influenced by the social gospel. Chapter 17, Part 2 Republicans argued gold was the only honest currency, and that abandoning it would prevent economic recovery by scaring creditors away from making loans. They nominated Ohio Governor William McKinley, who passed the highly protectionist McKinley Tariff in Congress in 1890. The 1896 election was the first modern presidential election. The Republicans poured an unprecedented amount of money into a highly organized campaign that used a massive educational effort directed against the Democrats' call for free silver. The results showed a nation divided along regional lines. McKinley won the election with the votes of industrial states in the Northeast and Midwest. Labor conflict did not produce political results. Party politics seemed to mute class conflict, not reinforce it. Industrial America for workers to industrialists voted solidly Republican and continued to do so for years. McKinley's victory shattered the political stalemate of the previous 20 years, launching a period of Republican dominance that would last until the 1930s and marked a height in voter participation, which ever since has been in decline. Populism's defeat in the South allowed for the imposition of new radical order. The Redeemers, a coalition of merchants, planters, and businessmen who ruled the region after 1877 and claimed to have redeemed the South for the corruption and horrors of black rule, worked to reverse Reconstruction's achievements. They reduced taxes and public spending and cut back public schools, which especially hurt blacks. New laws allowed the arrest of those without employment and increased punishment for petty crimes. As the South's prison population rose, 
Convicts, mostly poor blacks, were rented out to railroad, miners, and lumber companies as cheap, involuntary labor at a high profit. Labor unions in the South assailed the convict labor system. In the 1880s, Atlanta editor Henry Grady relentlessly promoted the dream of a new South in which industrialization and agricultural diversification would deliver prosperity to the region. While planters, merchants, and industrialists prospered, the region as a whole became more impoverished. While mining and textiles developed in some areas, the region's low wages and taxes and convict labor did not spur much economic development. By 1900, except for the major iron and steel city of Birmingham, Alabama, southern cities had little industry or mostly exported cotton, tobacco, and rice. The South as a whole stayed dependent on the North for capital and manufactured goods. Black farmers, the most disadvantaged rural southerners, suffered the most from the region's economic condition. In the Upper South, mines, iron mills, and tobacco factories offered some jobs to black workers and some black farmers owned land. In the rice kingdom of coastal South Carolina and Georgia, the plantations went to ruin, and many blacks acquired land and became self-sufficient farmers. In most of the Deep South, however, blacks owned a smaller percentage of land in 1900 than they had in the late 1870s. In southern cities, institutions such as schools, churches, businesses, and clubs created by blacks during Reconstruction formed the basis of dynamic black urban communities. But the labor market was racially divided and black men were excluded from skilled and professional occupations while black women were limited to wage work as domestic servants and were excluded from occupations open to white women. Most unions in the South excluded blacks from membership. Blacks, trapped at the bottom of an economically stagnant South, emigrated by the tens of thousands. In 1879 and 1880, nearly 60,000 African Americans moved to Kansas seeking political rights, safety, and education and economic opportunity. Its participants called the move the Exodus, named after the biblical account of the Jews' flight from slavery in Egypt. But despite worsening conditions, most blacks had no choice but to stay in the South. While economic expansion took place in northern cities, most employers there offered jobs only to white migrants from rural areas and European immigrants, not blacks. Only in World War I did jobs open up for blacks, helping spur a massive movement northward called the Great Migration. Despite redemption, blacks continued to hold office and vote in the South after 1877. Even while Democrats restructured Southern politics to limit blacks' political power and representation, blacks continued to hold office in states and Congress, but black political opportunities diminished in this period. Talented and ambitious black men increasingly avoided politics and entered business, law, or the church. Black women became political leaders, and respectable middle-class black women pressed for women's rights and racial progress through organizations like the National Association of Colored Women, formed in 1896. In some states, however, blacks continued to vote and Republicans stayed competitive with Democrats. By the 1890s, however, populist and Republican-led state governments such as North Carolina's fell to racial violence and electoral fraud. Between 1890 and 1906, every southern state enacted laws or constitutional provisions intended to eliminate the black vote. Because the 15th Amendment prohibited the use of race as a qualification for the suffrage, southern lawmakers designed laws that seemed colorblind, but were meant to keep blacks from voting. Most popular were the poll tax, a free citizen's pay to be eligible to vote, literacy test, and a requirement that a voter show the understanding of the state constitution. Although some white leaders presented disenfranchisement as a good government measure that would end fraud and violence in elections, it was a means for ending black participation in politics. And it worked. By 1940, only 3% of adult blacks in the South were registered to vote. Poor and illiterate whites were also disenfranchised by these laws. Disenfranchisement led to a generation of Southern demagogue politicians who mobilized white voters by appealing to their racism and disenfranchisement could not have occurred without northern approval. In 1891, the Senate defeated a proposal to protect black voting rights in the South, and the Supreme Court approved disenfranchisement laws. According to the 14th Amendment, any state that deprived its male citizens of the franchise was supposed to lose part of its representation in Congress, but this was not held to apply to blacks. Thus, Southern congressmen had far greater power than their small electorates warranted. Alongside disenfranchisement in the 1890s, segregation was imposed throughout the South. Laws and local customs that required separating the races had existed in the North before the Civil War, 
and during Reconstruction, Southern schools and other institutions had been segregated. In the 1880s, though, race relations in the South were fluid, with some railroads, theaters, and hotels admitting blacks and whites while others discriminated. In 1883, the Supreme Court invalidated the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which had outlawed racial discrimination by hotels and other public facilities, and held that the 14th Amendment banned unequal treatment by state authorities, not private business. In the landmark 1896 ruling, Plessy v. Ferguson, the court approved state laws requiring separate facilities for blacks and whites, arguing that segregated facilities did not discriminate as long as they were separate but equal. States responded to Plessy by passing laws requiring segregation in every part of Southern life, in schools, hospitals, toilets, and cemeteries. Despite the doctrine of separate but equal, facilities for blacks were either inferior or non-existent. Segregation was an important part of a system of white supremacy in the South, in which each part, such as disenfranchisement, economic inequality, inferior education, reinforced the others. Segregation did not so much keep races apart as ensure that whites would have the advantage wherever they did meet. A racial social etiquette developed, in which blacks had to give way to whites on sidewalks and could not raise their voices at whites or otherwise be assertive. Blacks who challenged white supremacy or refused to accept the indignities of segregation faced political and legal power and immediate violent reprisal. In each year between 1883 and 1905, more than 50 persons, most of them black, were lynched or killed by a mob in the South. Lynching continued well into the 20th century. Some were secret, others were public and promoted by organizers and a media. Lynchings often resulted in atrocities against the victims, and law enforcement rarely prevented lynching or punished lynchers. Many victims were accused of having raped or assaulted white women, an allegation often without basis. But many white Southerners considered preserving white womanhood a sufficient basis for extrajudicial murder. Lynching is virtually unknown as a phenomenon anywhere else in the world. The reconciliation of the North and South in the 1880s and 1890s came at the cost of widespread hopes for racial equality that had existed during and after the Civil War. In popular literature and at veterans reunions, the war came to be remembered as a tragic quarrel between brothers in which blacks had played no role and which had been caused by clashes over states' rights and the preservation of the Union, not slavery. Reconstruction came to be universally seen as a period of black misrule imposed on the South by the North, a view which legitimized disenfranchisement and segregation in the South. Southern governments and schools celebrated the lost cause of the Confederacy and condemned the evils of Reconstruction.